Välkommen till Global Access. Niklas Ekdal heter jag och ska ha ett samtal med Mellanöstern-experten Emma Sky som har haft tunga uppdrag i bland annat Irak. Historia och nutid är rubriken för årets upplaga av Global Access. Går det att dra slutsatser av händelser i det förgångna? Eller är människan dömd att upprepa gårdagens misstag? Hur använder auktoritära regimer det egna landets historia för att säkra makten? Vilken roll spelar den enskilde individen? I programmen försöker forskare, journalister och författare besvara dessa frågor. Demokrati, stabilitet och fred. Det hoppades Irakrigets arkitekter uppnå i Mellanöstern. 15 år senare präglas regionen av sekterism och inbördeskrig. Vad gick fel? Emma Sky, Mellanöstern-expert och med mångårig erfarenhet av att ha arbetat med återuppbyggandet av Irak, samtalar med Niklas Ekdal. Uh, the Western architects of the uh, invasion in Irak in 2003, they set out to create a new Middle East. Uh, Iraq should become a, a model democracy and that would pave the way for peace with Israel and all kinds of positive things. It didn't quite work out that way, did it? No. <laughs> no. I mean, that's what the architects envisaged. That the transformation of Iraq from dictatorship to democracy would be an inspiration to the region, would create this new democratic regional order. And as you said, peace with Israel. But when you actually look at what has been the impact of the Iraq war, you see that it mobilized a new generation of jihadis with a vision not of democracy, but of a caliphate. It changed the balance of power in the region in Iran's favor. And it really undermined the legitimacy of the United States, both as a model of democracy and the standard bearer of democracy. Mm. And that fallout that you have described very vividly in your, in your books, I mean, this emboldening of Iran, sectarian strife in Iraq, and it's been a disaster for Christian minorities across the region, uh, and the terror of Islamic State on top of that. W wasn't that a rather predictable outcome, in a sense, of the invasion? I don't think it was. I really don't. I mean, we should never have invaded Iraq. It was based on evidence in inverted commas, based on intelligence that proved to be faulty that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. And, you know, despite the war not being fought for the right reasons, there was nothing that happened in Iraq after 2003 that was inevitable. There really were hopes of a world without Saddam Hussein's and missed opportunities to create that better order And right at the beginning, the U.S. dissolved the Ba'ath Party and dismissed all the security forces so as to put Iraq on new foundations. But what that did was collapse the state, which led to Iraq's descent into civil war. And it was in among the chaos that al-Qaeda took root in Iraq and that Iran supported these different Shia militias. And that led to you know, hundreds of thousands of people being killed and millions displaced from their homes. Mm. It didn't have to happen that way. Right. But if, if we start by looking at the pretext, I mean, there certainly were good reasons to get rid of Saddam Hussein, given his record and his horrible crimes. Uh, but as you mentioned, the, the, the idea of weapons of mass destruction, actually after 91 and the first Gulf War, the UN and indeed America managed to put this weapons inspections regime in place, uh, as it happens under the leadership of Swedish diplomats, Rolf Akeus and then Hans yeah. Blix, who actually did a fantastic job. I mean, they managed to clear Iraq, more or less, of mm. weapons of mass destruction. So why do you think America and the UK dreamt up a threat that really wasn't there? I think the only way you can really understand the Iraq war is in the context of 9-11.
because it was after 9-11 and that fear, you know, you think President Bush has failed to prevent this terrible attack on the homeland and that fear of where might another attack come from. And, you know, there were obviously this group of neoconservatives that at the end of the Cold War, they envisaged a unipolar world and using, you know, muscular diplomacy to set the world to right, to bring democracy to the world. But they were kind of, you know, peripheral. But when George W. Bush became president, some of them got jobs in the uh, Department of Defense, some in the State Department. But still, if it hadn't been for 9-11, I don't think the invasion of Iraq would ever have happened. Yes, there was a policy that came in under Clinton that we would support the Iraqi opposition, but it never received much support. But after 9-11, and Bush said, you know, we're going to hunt down the terrorists and those who harbor them. But he went further than that, and he basically determined that America's liberty depended on the liberty of others because it was repressive states that produced terrorism. So spreading democracy was made a national security imperative to change the conditions that produce terrorists. And the cornerstone of his freedom agenda was Iraq. And the name of the war was Operation Iraqi Freedom. Mm. But if you look favorably at the American agenda, I mean, spreading freedom and democracy, uh, you could interpret that as sort of peak internationalism in a way. I mean, it was the polar opposite of isolationism to this massive undertaking with good intentions, basically. Uh, but wasn't it a bit more puzzling that a British government went along with this, considering Britain's colonial past in Mesopotamia, you know, trying to do basically the same thing a hundred years earlier? I think Tony Blair's number one agenda was to be a good ally to America. That was the primary driver of this. America had come under attack and Tony Blair said, you know, we, the United Kingdom, stand with you. This is not attack on America. This is attack on all, you know, Western countries. It was the first time, you know, the whole world rallied around America. It was the first time that NATO invoked Article 5, that an attack on one is an attack on all. So I think it, the spirit at the time well, yes, we stand together. Mm. And you yourself, although you were opposed to the actual invasion initially, then you volunteered uh, as a, um, um, a political advisor to the head of the American forces in Iraq and also uh, to, to lead the, the provisional authority in Kirkuk in northern Iraq. Uh, what was your main lesson from that that um, experience of, of nation building? Well, after the invasion, the British government asked for volunteers to go and administer Iraq. They said it would be for three months until we hand the country back to the Iraqis. And I was one of those who volunteered because I wanted to go out, apologize to everyone for the war. And I had this experience in capacity building, conflict resolution from- From Palestine. From Palestine. Maybe. So I thought I might have some useful skills to contribute. But before I left the UK, I didn't know what my job was going to be. They didn't have an advert saying, oh, we need a governor for a province. So I had no idea when I landed in Iraq. They just said, you know, land and it will all become clear. So I landed in Basra and there was no one there to meet me. So I went up to Baghdad and they said, we've got enough people here. Try the north. So I wandered around the north, got to Kirkuk. And then I was told I was now the senior civilian responsible for administering the province and reporting back to Ambassador Bremer, who was at the head of the province. You can imagine, I've never been a mayor of a small town in Britain, let alone the governor of a province in someone else's country. So it was very uncertain times. And I've you know, found a house in the center of Gokuk in which to live. And you know, my first week insurgents came to the house and they fired rockets right the way through the house. And I was very lucky, it was a well-built house, so the rockets were going through the walls up to where I was. I was upstairs in bed at the time. Unfortunately, the ceiling was well made, so the rocket had exploded by the time it sort of arrived in my bedroom as such. And you were in the bedroom at the time? Yes, yeah. yes. No, it was four in the morning. 
So it was a very uncertain times. Iraqis were pleased to see the back of Saddam and they were waiting for us to do lots of things for them. They thought we would, you know, they were like, it's America. America put a man on the moon. You are gonna make us a fantastic country within a matter of months. So they had very high expectations. Now I turn up, I had no idea what job I was going to be doing the week before. The coalition provisional authority had not existed before. So it was all being created on the hoof with volunteers just turning up to take these billets. But most of the Manning document, it was just fantasy. These people didn't exist. So you had the civilian side was very weak and the military side was much, much stronger. But the military had, you know, they'd only thought about invasion. They hadn't really thought about what comes next. So we were all put in a situation where we were having to make it up on the hoof. You know, the Americans turn to me and they say, you know, you're British, you know how to do this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, that was kind of a while ago. It's not genetic. <laughs> There's no handbook on how to be a colonial officer in someone else's country. So you really just have to rely on your instincts. And for me, that was getting to know the Iraqis. So Kukuk is a very interesting, very complex place. It's got people who are Kurdish, Arab, Sunni, Shia, Turkmen, Kakai. It's got all these different groups. And it has a lot of oil. So Mixed blessing. It's a mixed blessing because the Kurds had always wanted Kukuk to be part of their region because they saw that as a path to independence. And the government in Baghdad had always thought we've got to try and keep Kirkuk in Iraq. And so the Ba'ath Party had expelled non-Arabs from the province and had brought up Arabs from the south to live in the province to Arabize it. Mm. So you'd had this population exchange. And those people looked very negatively on the, the foreign presence, I suppose. Well, after 2003, the Kurds were trying to reverse the demographic changes. So right. the Kurds were coming back and kicking out the others. So we arrived in this sort of dispute between property and land, who owned what. People were trying to reverse decades of discrimination overnight. Very dangerous situation. It was very difficult, very difficult. Mm. And then you uh, testified b before the uh, Iraq inquiry in 2011. What were your main observations and, and conclusions there? You know, when I testified, it was the first time that anyone in the British government had actually asked me what I had been doing. So I had spent that time in Kirkuk and then I'd gone on to be the political advisor for the American, top American general during that period that we call the surge, which was 2007 to 2009. And so I tried to set out in my testimony what had led to the civil war. So the collapse of the state, the how we set up um, a governing council which was based on, based on sect and ethnicity. So we institutionalized sect and ethnicity. It was our policies, collapsing the state and institutionalizing sect and ethnicity that led to the civil war. And then I described to them how during the surge, Iraq came out of the civil war. So we had, for the first time, the right strategy, the right leadership, and the right resources. So I wanted to say that we had been sent out to Iraq without any political strategy as such, and the military just has to make things up on the hoof. But the civilian masters had no vision for what was the political outcome they wanted and how we could use the military instrument to get there. Mm. It is all about politics. And we tend to think of the technical solutions to things which are inherently, inherently political. So it was, you know, it was hard testifying, but I welcomed the inquest, the fact that the UK was actually trying to understand what went wrong and why. And then you addressed all these issues in your 2015 book, The Unraveling, Uh, missed high hopes and missed opportunities in Iraq. What were the main uh, mistakes, would you say, in brief? I mean, when the occasions when opportunities were missed along so I, the way. So at the beginning, for 2003, 
when there was goodwill towards us immediately after the invasion, and we just sacked everybody from their jobs, collapsed the state. Dismantled the... The, the Ba'ath Party, the army. all of that. So that was the big mistakes of the Bush administration. But by the end of 2009, when Bush left office, Iraq's civil war had ended and the country had stabilized. And, you know, Iraqis were optimistic the country was headed in the right direction, and so were we. And then it all unraveled. And the unraveling was the mistakes of the Obama administration. So in 2010, Iraqis had a very tightly contested national election. And a new coalition came together called Iraqia that campaigned on the platform of no to sectarianism, Iraq for all Iraqis. And this group went on to win the most seats in the election. But the incumbent Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki, just refused to believe the election results. The Shia leader. He sat there and he sat there and he said, no, nope, I don't believe it. And in the end, the Obama administration decided to back Maliki for a second term, believing that he was our man, that he would give the Americans a follow-on security agreement to keep forces in Iraq after 2011, and that keeping him in power was the quickest way of having a government in Iraq formed ahead of the US midterm elections that November. But it, was, it wasn't actually the Americans who managed to form the government because they opened up a vacuum that allowed the Iranians to step in. Mm. And the Iranians also decided they wanted to keep Maliki as prime minister because they knew that he was despised in the region and that would prevent Iraq from being integrated back into the Arab world and that he would ensure all US forces withdrew. In many ways, that's all, it's like an echo of the Vietnam war, in a sense, where domestic American politics played a crucial role and opportunities yeah. were missed because yes. of elections and so on. Yeah, and Maliki, you know, gets his second term, despite not winning the elections and with the Iranian support. And he then accused Sunni politicians of being terrorists, drove them out the country. And he arrested Sunnis en masse and the protests were violently crushed, and that created the conditions for the Islamic State to rise up out of the ashes of Al-Qaeda in Iraq that had been defeated sure. and proclaim itself as the defender of the Sunnis against the Iranian-backed sectarian regime of Nur al-Maliki. Mm. And then the West more or less left it to the Kurds to fight this monster of ISIS. What do you make of that? You know, it was only in 2014, after ISIS had taken over a third of Iraq, that America finally decides... 10 million people. Yeah, 10 million people in Iraq and Syria under ISIS control. And it was only then that the Obama administration decides to stop supporting Maliki. And the new prime minister, Haider Labadi, requested American support to help regain control of the country. So America put together a coalition to fight ISIS but it didn't put lots of troops on the ground as it had done before in the surge. Instead, it used air power in support of the Kurdish Peshmerga and the Shia militias. And this has brought about the crushing militarily of ISIS. But the conditions that led to the rise of ISIS in the first place have only got worse. And you look, you know, today, ISIS fighters are sentenced to death in trials at last minutes. ISIS women and children are kept in camps with no hope of rehabilitation. The Sunni cities are not receiving funds for reconstruction and nobody is talking about reconciliation. And during this fight against ISIS, Iran increased its influence in Iraq and Syria and has developed land corridors across Iraq and Syria up to Israel's borders. Mm. In Obama's defense, one might say that he was elected on a rather isolationist platform to sort of withdraw, withdraw from this failed um, occupation of Iraq, in a sense. And also the passivity in Syria uh, later on under Obama. Was, was that a fallout of, of Iraq as well, would you say? that America was so slow in, to react, not only to Islamic State, but to the whole horrible civil war emerging there, leaving the, yeah. the stage for Russia, Iran, and so on. Yeah, I mean, 
When people looked at Syria, they thought about Iraq. When Obama became president, Iraq was doing okay. It was headed in the right direction. And, you know, you think of 2011, when young people came out onto the streets and squares across the Middle East, protesting injustice, calling for better governance and demanding jobs. And Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, he could have responded to that. He thought the Arab Spring wouldn't affect him because he was relatively young and only been in power a decade. I say only, but it only been a decade. But instead he used violence and that propelled the country's descent into civil war. And Obama came out early and said, Assad must go, but gave very little support to force his departure. And segments of the Syrian opposition then took up arms and they sought external support in their domestic conflict. And the Saudis, the Qataris, the Emiratis and the Turks all started providing funds and weapons to competing Sunni groups. And then Iran came in with its military advisors and it brought militias, Shia militias from Iraq, Afghanistan and Lebanon to prop up Assad. And then the Russians. And the Russians came and gave them air power. And the result, we all know, I mean, hundreds of thousands of deaths and massive refugee flows to Europe and, and so on. So what could the West have done differently, do you think, at what junctures in this sad story? Well, I think if the election results in Iraq had been upheld in 2010. Mm. And, but in Syria in particular. I, but it, it relates, yeah. because if the election results had been upheld, there would have been no space for ISIS to come back up. So you wouldn't have had... ISIS as such. In Syria, and ISIS then you know, comes, it, it treats Iraq and Syria as one battlefield. At the beginning, instead of calling Assad to go, if there'd been much more emphasis sorry, on mediation, mm -hmm. let's not look at this as good guys, bad guys. Let's look at how we can mediate between the different groups and stop the acceleration that was happening. Another potential option would be to say, OK, if we're going to go in to say Assad must go, you can't say Assad must go, then do nothing. Because people thought we were going to intervene, as we were doing in Libya at the time. So they thought we were going to intervene, and that led people to take up arms, believing that the West was coming to help. Why the Syrian opposition was so split up was because there was no leadership from the West, and there was no one funnel of support. So you look at Iran became the main leader to the Shia groups. So it was everything was just going through Iran. But on the, for the Sunni opposition, there was no American leadership as such. It was very weak. And so all the other countries were supporting all these other competing groups, and it created this big competition. Mm where among the Shia groups, you didn't see big competition. You just saw it much more disciplined. So we more or less ended up in the worst of all worlds, in a way. I mean, the way you describe it, it, it would have been better not to encourage the uprising, in a sense, since the West wasn't willing to back it up yes, with it, force. Yes, it gave the impression it was going to. Yeah. But then you get to, you know, 2013 with the chemical attacks. The red, well, famous red line. Obama had said it, it would be a red line. And then he backed down on his threat of military repercussions after Assad gassed 1,400 people in eastern Ghouta in Damascus. And Obama grabbed Russia's offer of removing Assad's chemicals. So Assad was let, you know, let off the hook completely and continued to kill his people and drive them out of the country and use chemical weapons. So a complete disdain was shown for international norms. I mean, all sides committed atrocities in Syria, but the regime was the worst offender. And there's been total impunity for torture, the targeting of hospitals, the deliberate destruction of religious shrines. So the whole idea of an international community really withered away, I think, in, inside Syria. Mm. And also the way you describe it, it turned into a sort of proxy war, uh, drawing in the Iranians, uh, the Russians, uh, and so on. And the clear winners seem to be the most sordid regimes, if you will. I mean, Damascus, Tehran, Moscow has been emboldened. So what do you make of that outcome? 
you know, the Iraq war changed the balance of power in the region in Iran's favor because Saddam's Iraq had been the Arab bulwark keeping Iran in check. And this change of balance in the balance of power sparked this geopolitical struggle between Iran on the one hand and Saudi, the Emirates on the other, leading them to support these sectarian actors in different countries, turning what were essentially local grievances over poor governance into these regional proxy wars. Now, Obama viewed a nuclear deal with Iran as the US exit strategy from the region, because he wanted to pivot to Asia. And so he was reluctant to push back on Iranian expansionism because he feared it would jeopardize the chances of reaching that agreement. And, you know, with his signaling of leading from behind, pivoting to Asia, he created a vacuum that was filled by Iran, Russia, non-state actors, militias. And, you know, unfortunately, what happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. Refugees and terrorists are not contained there. And we saw the impact of this. So hundreds of thousands of people fleeing the Middle East, crossing the Mediterranean on these flimsy boats to try and reach refuge in Europe. Mm. And you remember the horrific terrorist attacks inside Europe with ISIS trying to provoke a backlash against Muslims to show that the West was at war with Islam and to recruit more Muslims to their cause. And all of this served to rouse up populist, nationalist, anti-immigration sentiments in Europe. Sure. The hourglass is running out on us here, so one last question then concerning Iran. I mean, Iran has been perceived as a mortal enemy of the US for 40 years now. Uh, and still, if you look at the moves by America and its allies, Saudi Arabia and Israel as well, it has often played into the hands of the Iranian regime. If you look at Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq, Syria uh, as well. Uh, where do you see the strategic thinking in Washington concerning Iran? Well, in Washington, the policy is to put immense pressure on Iran, using sanctions, withdrawing from the nuclear agreement in order to either drive Iran back to the negotiating table or to ensure the collapse of the regime. But, you know, when you look at Iran today, it's not in a revolutionary moment. You don't have other groups waiting to take power. And the extra pressure being put on Iran, it's not clear that Iran will go in the direction the US hopes. It's always got proxies to support. It's got other instruments it can use. It doesn't look too constructive. Emma Sky, time's up. Thank you so much for the Thank talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.